trying to get back to the basics of great products. Power comes from sharing information. I try to convince people to slow down. Free. Yeah. Open. This is the Soak Tyson Podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Soaked by Slush podcast. My name is Isak Rautio. I'm here at Copenhagen. And uh, as my co-host for this episode, uh, Ona, back in Helsinki. How are you doing, Ona? I'm doing great. How are you, Isak? I'm great. Looking forward to another episode. In this episode, we have as our guest, Sofia Nunes from Mambu. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Isak. Thanks for having me. As uh, Before we get into the nitty-gritty, uh, would you like to give a short introduction of who you are and what do you do professionally? Of course. I'm one of the co-founders of Mambo and I'm also leading uh, the culture. So I'm head of culture at Mambo and we're a scale-up company at the moment. We have um, 500 Mamuvians all over the world and so I'm helping driving the efforts to that scale-up phase that we're facing. And um, we don't come up, come by so many co-founders and heads of culture. Um, why do you think that is? And how did you become co-founder and then head of culture as well? Well, the co-founding story uh, started, well, <laughs> 11, 12 years ago, actually, when I met my two other co-founders during our master's program in human computer interaction. And uh, we became friends before we even started to start a company together. Um, and I think that will eventually lead to what the culture became and what we defined as a culture. But about my story, about my, my path, uh, in the beginning being not the technical co-founder, so my two other founder, co-founders were the technical and business-oriented backgrounds. I was more coming from the clinical psychology and social sciences. And as such, um, I was a bit filling the gaps uh, with everything, right? So if we needed uh, support in support, then I would do support. I was leading support, then sales, then delivery projects. And so there was not a very traditional career path for me in the first few years of Mambo, if you wish. And But the core of it was always the people, right? So at, at some point I started directing and narrowing down that area of focus more to the people side of things and um, ended up going through to more talent acquisition, <laughs> HR, people operations, and then culture. I think culture is really the core and it's where I feel that I'm the best, <laughs> uh, that I can contribute the best to, to Mambo at this stage. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of dive deeper just a little bit on that. What does culture mean for you? How would you define culture, mm -hmm. company culture? Well, I'll define it. It's not my definition, but I think it's the one that is the best and the easiest is culture is how we do things here, right? It's uh, it's really uh, everything. It's uh, It permeates everything you do, really. It's not about perks. It's not about benefits. It's not about, it's really how you operate, how you and your employees and your company operates, how you deal with customers, with partners, with each other, how you collaborate, how you uh, reward, how you um, hire people, everything. All, all of those processes and systems are uh, essentially culture, right? That's your culture. It's your DNA, essentially. That's a very good definition. Thank you. What about uh, Mambo and the culture at Mambo? Uh, let's start breaking down the the, sort of the core philosophy uh, when mm -hmm. you started uh, thinking about this. What is the core philosophy behind the culture at Mambo? Yeah, so I think when we founded the company uh, 11 years ago now, um, and after working on that concept for one year, as I said, during our master's degree, um, I think that's when the culture started in a way being defined. So we we started as, uh, like I said, two, uh, three friends uh, at a time. And we were very different. So we have very different personalities. We still do, but we also have very, had very similar values. Uh, so when it comes to how we wanted to interact with people, with our world in general, with the environment, those were very similar values that we shared. And I think that helped us defining uh, the culture when we eventually started the company. Uh, and this was not intentional in the beginning. It was really not 
strategically defined and we didn't sit and say, okay, let's do things this way. But just because we shared those common values, that's how we started um, the culture. And for us, the, our philosophy of culture is really that it drives the strategy. So uh, it is a core part of the business. Yeah. There's so many interesting, I think we're going to get into the more specifics of, of what culture is, uh, sort of, and how it, how it happens basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, um, I think, uh, well, actually let's get, let's get there now. Cause there's something when you said culture is something, cu culture is about the how, and there's something very inherent in the word how, like, it seems like it's such an underlying factor, uh, for, for operations. How much of, of that culture is something that just happens organically? It's just, it just has to click before it can even be thought about in some mm -hmm. strategic sense. Yeah. It is very organic, but it has to also be intentional. So, and the way we can influence it. So I see culture as an organism and we uh, might get deeper on this, but I see it really as an organism that you have to feed to in order to grow and to evolve the right, the way you want and you idealize it, right? So it's not something that you can impose uh, as a leader, you as a leader or as a CEO or as a founder. It's not something that you write on the wall as this is our core values and now this is the way we will operate from now. This is really something that you need to create the framework, the systems and the processes in order for it to grow and to flourish as you want, right? And so this is about thinking about all your processes, all about your, uh, how you, again, how you hire, who you hire, uh, what type of environment, what type of people do you want to have in the company, right? This is a, a very important decision to any culture, right? So what type of people will uh, share those core values? And regardless of the differences, right? So you have the diversity aspect there, right? So we want to have diversity in the teams. All teams want to have that. But the core values and the shared values have to be there in order for this culture then to, to grow and to evolve as we want. But it is, it is very much strategic in the way that you have to look at those systems and processes and make sure they are the right ones to make it easy for people to just live that way, uh, having taking into account that they do share those core values that, that you also have. And diving deeper into, you talked about operations and how mm -hmm. kind of through those you can also feed the culture and how those define the culture. Can you think of some key operations, rules, habits um, that at Mambu have been kind of in key position in defining the culture, like feedback, uh, the way you give feedback, the way you reward people, um, meetings, like how do you... Mm -hmm operate meetings or what are kind of the key operation, operations and habits that define the yeah. culture? I think one key that I would like to, to mention is appreciation. So this is one of our core values and this is uh, something that we are very um, focused on, right? So recognizing people, appreciating people, not just in terms of awards, that also, but not just that, but also how we, um, how we promote, how we, um, how we reward uh, the people, who, not just by performance, but uh, when they live by our values. So today, for example, we have, and this is very interesting, so we have our uh, session of um, where we will announce the Outstanding Mabuvians. This is an initiative we created four or five years ago, uh, which is about recognizing those people that throughout the year live by our values. So they went above and beyond their role description uh, and try to make Mambo, generally try to create Mambo, make Mambo a better place for them and for others. And this is something that we thought it would be really important to recognize and just have uh, this, we have this uh, announcement session every year. We have all the leaders electing uh, a group of people that actually did that and live by our values throughout the, the year. And then it's really important to recognize that, to, to, to say, yes, we, we do recognize performance. We have our performance reviews and all that, but um, living by our values is really fundamental for us and for what makes us us, right? So we want to recognize that. That's one of the, the, the things, for example, appreciation. I'd be interested to hear how you got 
there. You mentioned you founded the company 11 years ago. I'm sorry, was it 11 years ago, approximately? Yeah. So pretty, yeah, quite a while ago, like a decade ago. And you, you said you started it with a group of friends. And I can imagine, uh, uh, well, there's obviously the fact of you being friends from before and then that the groove is small, the like culture is easily manageable at that mm. point. But as you start growing, as you start scaling up, how do you make sure that the culture grows with it? Yeah. How do you manage it? Yeah, that's very true. So when we started, we were essentially um, uh, two, well, we started growing the company back then, but we were still in two offices, let's say. So it was Germany and one in Romania where our technical team was. And it was very easy, like the, the level of interaction was quite high. And we were all, the three of, between the three of us, we were all hiring um, the people that were coming to Mount, right? So we were, for the first two, three years, we, uh, were part of the interviews for all those people. So it was very easy to keep in touch with those values and to, to see if there was this fit <laughs> to our core values. Um, as we grew, of course, we had to let go of that, right? And obviously rely on other people to do that for us. And with that came the question. So how do we ensure that those traits and those characteristics that we uh, were looking for in people were still present throughout the hiring process, but everything else that we do? And how could we make them more tangible in a way? And that's when we, came up with the values, right? So when we started defining our core values and uh, thinking they would serve as a reference essentially um, to everything that we would do from then on, including hiring. So we gathered input uh, from the team, we compared uh, with our own values and uh, established these five principles since then uh, that have helped us guiding how we uh, do our hiring process, but everything we do at Mambu. And now, we're again at a stage where we need to once again rethink that and be a bit more strategic about it and operationalize them even more, if you wish. So in a way that makes it more tangible and resonate with um, more people. And uh, so we're doing that at the moment. This is, uh, that goes back to the systems and processes and that deep analysis that we need to do um, that uh, involves uh, the whole employee journey, right? So to look at all the touch points and to see, are we actually uh, living by our values in everything that we do from hiring to offboarding, right? So all of the process from the candidate and employee journey. And that's one exercise that we're looking at uh, doing now. And if you look at it from a usability perspective, which uh, I, I really love, it's about making sure that we design this experience and the framework that makes it easy for everyone to apply our core values, right? So that people don't have to think or uh, when they have, they're faced with a challenge or anything during their day-to-day -day work, they don't need to think, how should I do? They actually know because it's just easy. The process is there, the framework is there, and it's easy for them to think back about their own values and then act based on what we, we do in our culture. So that's the exercise we're actually going through now. Do you want to dive a bit more deeper into these? Uh, you mentioned a lot of uh, touch points and operationalization of, of cultural development and all these things. Do mm -hmm. you have any examples of how you how you actually did this? Like, what is it like for a new Mambuvian to come into the team? Yeah, so we're still doing it again. It's just about, uh, for example, the the onboarding process. So we we do. Um, look at the hiring process, so the candidate journey, and then there's a, a team of doing the, the talent acquisition team doing the hiring process with the hiring managers, and then there's the onboarding, right? And during the, the onboarding, we just started last year with a boot camp, for example. So every month, there's two boot camps where we uh, welcome the new joiners um, to Mambo, and they come from different regions. This is not done by team at all, so it's just all the people who joined during that month. And during that boot camp, we, we do share um, obviously a bit of the, the story uh, of the company, um, the a little bit of the planned organizational structure in a way. So just having the different leaders talking about their different functions, uh, what it is about, what the impact is in the business, et cetera. But also a very core, <laughs> core aspect is the core values, right? So our guiding principles, what they are about, uh, how in part they translate into day to day, um, uh, business and work, and so, and then they, the the, the boot campers go away and have an exercise with the, the values, for example. So they just have to go away and think about one value and come up with uh, something that that reflects that in their own mind. So how that resonated with them. So just about 
embedding that thought already in them. And this is a first step. We're not quite there yet. So we need to, to be a little bit, again, more detailed <laughs> on how we want to do this. But I think it's already uh, great. And the feedback has been fantastic on the bootcamp and how people are feeling onboarded and connected uh, because there's also that social part, right? So because you are being onboarded with a group of people uh, with you, you already create those bonds, even if these people are from other teams and other regions, even in the cross time zones. So that's uh, one of the aspects that we've been focusing on. How do you, as a, you're managing this uh, big team now and you're, you're thinking about culture, this big organization, how do you maintain a sort of genuine grassroots view of, of the situation so that you don't, so that the distance between you and everyone else doesn't grow into this massive gap where you lose all every, all perspective of the sort of real experience of what it's like to be a uh, Mambuvian. Yeah, so this is a very personal approach. I don't know, I don't think this would work for everyone, but my approach uh, at least is, I'm a strong believer in um, connecting with people one-on-one. -on -one. And so I have frequent conversations um, where we explore concerns, but also opportunities. And from there, we start discovering patterns that will feed into the more strategic part of what I do, right? And in a fast growing company like ours, of course, we, we can't have these conversations with everyone. So every month I have a handful uh, of recurrent chats with uh, leaders from the different functions. But I also try to um, talk to other people from completely different roles and regions so that they can share their unique insights um, into how they're doing in the different areas, right? And this, to me at least, has been the most valuable time I have spent in the company. Uh, it has allowed me to, to grasp realities that I wouldn't otherwise have and um, that we don't grasp from a survey, for example, right? So just this one-on-one -on -one to me has been extremely, extremely valuable. Again, it doesn't work for everyone, but to me, this has been also my way of feeling connected and uh, deeply connected with the realities across the organization, right? Not just uh, at a leadership level or just <laughs> in a specific region, but across the whole organization. Just out of curiosity, is the, are the one-on-ones agenda always kind of open-ended and whatever the person who is talking with mm. you kind of needs to or wants to share? Or are is there a structure and is there some questions that kind of continually give you the right kind of input or something that you always ask? Yeah, it, it, it's a blended. <laughs> it's a mix of those. So some of them, we already have a topic in advance, and this can come from uh, something that happened, something that occurred on that week and that we really want to discuss. Otherwise, it's really open-ended and we just see how it goes, right? So, it, and that I, I like to maintain that, the serendipity of it too, right? Because we, we lost a little bit of that with, um, with the pandemic and just that casual chat by the coffee machine or while you're having a meal together, right? We lost a lot of that. So I like to keep this somehow as a, a proxy of what we used to have uh, when we were able to do that. And I feel like there's a lot of value in that too. So I, that allows people to just come open-minded, right? And then share what is actually in their minds and actually is a concern for them or as they see as an opportunity. So um, again, there's a mixed approach. With the recurrent chats, yes, sometimes I do. we do have topics that we want to discuss in advance um, because again, these are recurrent and we know we will have another one next month. So there's no point in just going in an open conversation. We, we do some uh, have some structure, but for the more um, casual ones, then yes, we, we, we keep it as open as possible. That COVID thing is so fascinating, like how people deal with that. Like, this is not just a company thing. This is just, an, this is, this is how we think about interpersonality these days in general. And like how we, uh, it's interesting. Uh, can, could you, could you speak more about the serendipity and the spontaneity and the sort of, uh, uh, that sort of thing when it comes to interactions with people at the office like this this feels way more deliberate in some sense and do you do you lose something when when these communications are that deliberate and how do you work around that you do lose of course and, and that's why i'm saying I, I like to have these open conversations where you somehow bring back a little bit of that the serendipity uh, of course by the just by the fact that you are agreeing on a time and a schedule with that person 
the serendipity part can get a little bit diluted, but I think it's still possible to achieve it when you have that open-ended um, space where you can just create something with that, that person in terms of the conversation and where it goes. Now, of course, yes, it, it, we did lose um, that with uh, the pandemic. And uh, I know some companies have been remote <laughs> from the very beginning and uh, they somehow managed to, to, to go through this and uh, find a culture that fits them, right? In our case, we were not like this and most companies were not. So we have to find and do adjustments, make adjustments in order to get a little bit from that that we, we lost. And that's what we've been doing. So essentially increasing communication a, a lot but also providing some guidelines, for example, for managers on how to have those one-on-ones and how to be uh, sensitive to, to some um, uh, issues that can arise and uh, well, specific situations that people might have, family situations, household, and depending on their realities in this whole pandemic, just being able to support them uh, and being or by offering more flexibility or just uh, offering other type of support. So that's what we've been doing in order to to capture a little bit of that that we we lost during last year. But it sounds like it hasn't been a complete kill shot to culture, and and even this like this works. It's 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 not bad. I think we we can still talk and exactly. and we can hear each other and we can see each other and and so so basically it's not that bad. It's not, and uh, I mean in Mumble we were already quite flexible in terms of um, people being able to work from home uh, a few days. So. It's not that it was, uh, it was a bit dramatic for some, and I, I always go back to some examples of people who were used to, especially in more commercial roles, who were traveling so much and just meeting customers <laughs> every week, uh, if you wish, and spending, I guess, one week uh, per month in their apartment, and all of a sudden uh, were forced in that apartment for the rest of the year, right? So there's that those situations, there's situations of parents with kids that now are, are also struggling in that way. So uh, yeah, there was a, a change, um, but we were also we were also very digital already, right? So we were very uh, agile in terms of adaptation and how we were able to adapt to that. Now, yes, we need to be, again, more conscious of the fact that some people are struggling more than others too. And we just need to create that space and to make sure that people are comfortable in, in, in sharing and to uh, to have these one-on-ones a, a bit more frequently and just to to make sure we are flagging those um, situations and how to, to support them in a better way. Has this started uh, defining culture in Mambu in a larger scale? Has it kind of turned back on itself? Have you started thinking about how to manage a, a long-term pandemic situation uh, or at least at least this type of, sort of remote work situation? Mm. Yeah, of course. We, we started thinking about uh, the post-pandemic, of course. Uh, I think it's an exercise that all companies should be doing at the, at the moment. And not just that, but what if this happens again, right? So just in terms of being prepared uh, for this to happen um, or the similar situation, hopefully not, but just something that forces us again to be remote. And I think there'll be many changes um, along the way. And yes, we have been thinking about that. How will be the return to the office, for example? Uh, how do we want our offices to be? Are they going to still be the same? Is it going to be a different space? Is it a space that now people use for a different purpose and not just to, to be there the whole day working on their own, right? Is it more for the collaboration aspect now? So we are thinking about that and also about um, the flexibility that will come from this, right? So additional flexibility that people will expect, honestly, and um, fairly so, right? After more than one year working from home and now forcing people to come back to the office and work from home only one day per month, for example, wouldn't make any sense, right? So I think all companies should be making this effort at this point, the ones who, who are in, the, in this type of industry more technologically, um, oriented, but I think it's a lot about that, about um, creating more flexibility and offering people the option to come to the office, but also work from home for more focused work if they have the environment and if they want. Because we we did uh, a survey back in uh, last year, um, end of last year, and about the pandemic and about how we could support and just see what the um, the reality was and the 
majority of the feedback was in terms of once we go back to the office to have that flexibility. So having the option to work from home, but also to have the office space still as an option. You know, people don't in their in the majority of the cases in Mambo at least, they don't want to be remote completely. So it's uh, really this blended approach. Um, thinking about the pandemic and how things have changed, from your point of view, has that changed how you, what are your culture KPIs, how you measure them? Uh, have have you had to change kind of your targets and and how you measure them? Not really. So I think for our KPIs, we we do look at different different ones, of course. Um, so one of them is uh, engagement and um uh, employee satisfaction uh, rates, so that's that's one of them, and we we continue having that. Um, but also, for example, internal mobility. So how uh, people who move uh, within the company to other roles and to other positions, or um, people who come back. We've had a few situations of those too. So people who uh, left the company to pursue another opportunity and then came back. So we are <laughs> having some of those cases, and all of those, I think. Are metrics that we will continue uh, using, as well as uh, metrics that are usually associated with uh, business, actually, because that's uh, those are are key also for culture, right? So how you do in business is also a reflection of how your culture is. So we also look at those as a metric for for culture. So not really, not many changes at the moment. Yeah, I just wanted to um, follow on that. It's okay if you can't share, but um, if you can share, it would be interesting to know how do you measure engagement uh, and employee satisfaction? Mm, we have um, we have this survey uh, it's going out uh, twice a year. We're actually just about to launch uh, the new one next week. And it's for the engagement part it's, and uh, the employee satisfaction. It's quite telling. It, it allows you to get a deep dive into the issues and the concerns and what uh, what we need to improve on, what we're doing well. And there's some different uh, areas from leadership to communication to uh, employee satisfaction, all of that. So all of that is uh, in that survey. And from there, we, we have a plan on how to then um, discuss this, the, the topics with each leader, with each function, and draw a plan, an action plan on how to tackle a potential improvement uh, areas. And we've been doing it for two years now, and that's been quite um, interesting. Uh, and again, not really revealing, if you wish, so because, and I think that's good. <laughs> so we are still able to be uh, quite connected with people and with the team. So it's not that we've had massive surprises and uh, when we, we run these surveys, but it still allows you to to go deeper in the issues because people can comment, they can add, it. there's open questions, of course, they can comment on every single question. And just the fact that people actually do that and go through the time of doing that, of, of uh, sharing that information shows us um, the engagement too, right? So it's about um, even if it's constructive or negative feedback on any aspect, just the fact that they're spending the time doing it and writing about it, it means that they still care, right? And that's an uh, additional reason for us to, to pay attention to it and to act on it. So that's how we've been uh, we've been doing so far. And is it an annual questionnaire or do you ask it more often? Twice a year, yeah. So every six months, roughly. Are there any? Because I'm, I'm still fascinated by Ona's first question uh, about the KPIs. Uh, maybe it. Uh, I don't know if this phrasing is helpful, but are were there any? not known unknowns, but any unknown unknowns that were revealed about your culture after this uh, new remote work uh, pandemic situation hit that you maybe realized that were there, that you haven't hadn't noticed that explicitly before it was perhaps gone? Mm. Uh, I'm not sure. Again, we there was not a drastic change. Of course, everyone had to suddenly stay stay home for long, much longer than, than before. But we were, in a way, again, because we're still not a 
big company, we were still very connected, even with the different regions, right? So we're not connected as a whole as much as we, we could be and ideally would be in terms of uh, daily conversations. Of course, at this pace is not, not um, possible, but we're still very connected with the regions and knowing what's going on and what's uh, what's happening with the different offices and with the, the people in those offices. So it's not that there was, mm, how to say, a drastic change in the way we operate and the way we communicate and collaborate. So we had to do adjustments, of course. Again, technology was already our friend before that and continues being and uh, will continue as such. Um, and one thing I didn't mention before, and that could potentially also, it does help a lot on this connectedness that we lost, is the fact that we have a group of people um, that are elected every year. So they're our cultural ambassadors, that's how they're called. And their main role is essentially to bring back this social uh, connectedness, right? So just to, um, we started this program last year, actually just before the pandemic hit. And the goal was to, to have this in the office and to have these activities and initiatives that people could get together and connect after work or uh, in any time of the week. But um, then the pandemic hit and all of a sudden they were forced to do this, all of this virtually. And it's been fantastic really to see the results. So uh, of course they started with some um, online virtual activities, but now one of the things that actually, one of the positive aspects of all of this is that instead of doing it uh, locally and just having these initiatives just in a local basis for each office is to actually go broader than that. And since we're virtual anyway, just putting several offices together and having these joint virtual um, initiatives that people can get together and get to know each other. Um, so that's been one very positive aspect of, uh, of this. And so that has helped that initiative in itself. So having these people who are uh, the, the glue essentially between uh, all our Mamuvians has been also crucial in this um, situation, right? Because the connectedness, the social aspect that you missed, that you lost during the pandemic has somehow been um, brought to life with them. Uh, something that managers wouldn't have the capacity, for example, to do, right? To just organize these activities. And so these are just uh, ongoing. Every month there there is at least one initiative that will be um, uh, organized by, by these by this group of people. And it's been fantastic, really. The results and the engagement of people uh, on the activities has been really, really amazing. That's great. That's fantastic. How, um, I'm gonna turn this question uh, or this theme on its head a little bit now. Because uh, I'm fascinated by this sort of approach to culture as a kind of craft even, because it's, it's, it is such an underlying thing that exists almost behind every operation or like supporting operations in, a, in, a, in an almost subconscious way, ideally. I don't know if you agree with that premise, but but then what is, if you, if you think about uh, culture as a craft, what is the role of control in in creating a culture and, and i guess what i mean by this and what i mean by turning this theme on its head when does culture or how does culture become almost suffocatingly immersive or even mm -hmm. like even cultish you could say like is there such a thing even do you think that yeah. it's a legit thing to keep in mind a little bit like I said before, I don't think you can impose a culture on an organization. I don't think it's something that you can impose it in itself. The culture is like this organism, right? That you, you can make it grow um, and flourish depending on the nutrients that you give it, right? If it feels suffocating or cultish, then it's because it's been fed to evolve that way, if you wish. Um, and the nutrients are, again, the systems, the processes, the stories that you tell, uh, the leadership behaviors, all of that feeds into the culture, the way that you hire, that you recognize, uh, that you promote, that you let people go, all of it will inform the culture and shape it in a certain way. So it's not really about a, a CEO or a leader or co-founder to um, decide what the culture will be and impose that by writing it on the wall or everywhere and expect people to follow. That won't really happen. It has to be something that's systemic, that's created, that's enabled, and then it will flourish. But then, yes, it is about the people to, to actually live it and actually do it. So I don't think, again, control and um, making it uh, in a way that will become enforced, I don't think this is even possible because people will eventually, if it feels that way, 
it's because the people who are there also live by those values and they want to promote that and to evolve it that way. Otherwise, it won't uh, it won't survive. Yeah, I keep I keep pretentiously quoting song lyrics in this podcast. I don't know what the producers think about that, but this <laughs> reminds me of Neil Young. Uh, like, I think it's Love is a Rose is the song and like the rose only grows when it's on the vine. I think that's yeah. the sort of basic uh, philosophy here, that's exactly. which is a yeah. And and. And uh, do you, how fine is the line? How do you how do you manage this uh, in practice? How do you approach this? Do you, do you ever think about this this control aspect in your own own work and how you think about culture? Not control, really. I mean, like I said, yes. Uh, as being head of culture, you might think that way. Oh, we want things to be this way, but you really need to. First of all, you need to know exactly, yes, what your core beliefs are, your core values are, and we are very clear about that uh, as founders, but then you need to walk the talk, right? That's that's one of the key aspects of it. You need you yourself, but all the leadership team has to do this. And if not, then it, it's a massive sign that things won't go the way uh, you would like them to go because it's just, again, having the core values and uh, mentioning them everywhere and then living not according to that, but in opposite reaction to it just won't work. So people will actually take that as a culture. So you need to to lead um, by example, really. You need to be the role model and and do what you want people to to be doing in your company, which should be easy, right? It, it shouldn't be an effort. If you really believe if these are your core values as a person, you should be walking the talk, right? Because this is how you live. You are not forcing it. You are not pretending anything, right? And so that should be quite easy. And um, so I, I don't feel control uh, as a word that I think a lot about. It's more really about enabling and about creating this uh, framework for people to 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 live by our values really it's a good answer uh how do let's uh let's expand this a little bit how do you um maybe more generally then what are some red flags in culture that you notice uh we already went through this the the earlier part but what are some other sort of cultural red flags and how do you think about sort of uh mending mending things in a sense mm -hmm. I can give you one example, and I think most companies might have had <laughs> one of these at some point. Uh, it's your attitude um, towards the brilliant jerks. <laughs> and brilliant jerk being the person who delivers great results. They are excellent at what they do, but they are a bully towards their teams. And this is especially concerning if it's someone uh, in a leadership position, right? So. Um, what you as a company do or don't do to deal with these situations is has a huge impact on the culture. If you accept this behavior um, without taking, so if you accept this behavior without taking action, then the message is that these behaviors are tolerated and maybe even rewarded. So if your core values and your code of conduct go against that, then there's a clear conflict that needs to be resolved. And it should be really easy one to resolve, right? So if excuse me, if you're clear about what you as a company stand for and what you want to do and don't want to allow, then you should make that person aware of their behavior and work with them on a plan to change and adjust to the culture. If the behavior changes, fantastic. Now you have this brilliant person who in the team who lives by our values. So that's that's the ideal situation. If the behavior doesn't change, however, then the person needs to go. And really that's the only way to preserve the culture and to show that you are really serious about your core values. So if you, on the other hand, you choose not to do anything about the situation and you, you just ignore it, then it's, to me, it's a sign that you might have to seriously review your values and what you stand for. Because no matter what, you really want to be honest to your people, so the people who are already uh, in the company, and but also for, to the ones who will potentially be hired. So you want to have this message both internally and externally in order to attract the people that you uh, want to, to, to attract, attract for the company. So well, no matter what you do, these need to be consistent. So if you decide that you want to tolerate bullying or that uh, you want to allow now people to work uh, or force people to work 80 hours per week, you can say that you also stand by uh, work-life balance, right? That this is one of your <laughs> uh, key aspects in the team because those are not compatible. And Uber, for example, is a good example of this 
transparency, right? So they used to have, I don't know if it's still part of their values, but always be hustling was one of their values. So just work harder, work more, more, more. And arguably this is be- probably not the best culture for everyone, but clearly it is for some people, right? So you want to attract those people and that's why it's in your best benefit to be transparent and to um, advertise your values as they are, right? So this is one of the very telling, I think, uh, cases where you need to uh, look at and to see how you want to deal with the, the situation of the brilliant jerk. That's a that's a great example. Um, do you think that that kind of situation can arise or can cause a clash between those people who measure the performance um, more and then, for example, head of culture who has to also look after the, I don't know if that's right to call them like softer values but the values of the company and so on yeah. and how do you how to solve those that clash between those different parties mm-hmm. then i think that's uh exactly by and this goes back to culture exactly so if you are very clear about your values and about not just the values about oh, our value is integrity or this you need to actually operationalize it in behaviors, right? So if you are very clear about those and those are well-defined and you know what you stand for, this should be a very easy solution, right? So in the performance, you are already taking these into account. So you also know in performance reviews that these are not tolerated behaviors or they are, right? Again, this is your choice, but this is based on the values and what behaviors you define as part of those uh, values. And so it, there shouldn't be a conflict at all. Uh, if there is, again, there should. it's because they are not well solidified, right? They need a little bit more work uh, or the, the, the people need to work and, and collaborate a little bit more in order to um, align on those. But the values should really be your answer to all of these challenges, all of these issues that can arise. Great. Thank you so much, Sophia for joining us the Soak by Sauce podcast. Thank you. Really appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. And listeners, remember to comment, rate, and subscribe. Uh, follow us on social media everywhere. We have the descriptions down in the description box. And uh, uh, yeah, see you next time. Thank you.